Hi, I'm Paul Kelly from TVA Surge. In the past few years, I've been experimenting with photogrammetry to make 3D models for surgical education. And in this tech talk, I'm gonna be showing the workflow for creating 3D models using the PC-based software 3D Flow Zephyr. So the basic idea behind photogrammetry software is to take a series of photos covering as many vantage points as possible of a subject and use the parallax between the photos to produce a point cloud. We densify the point cloud and then build a 3D polygon mesh, then reapply the color information from the photos, which can then be exported as a texture map. These final assets can be used in animation or in game engine software. Photogrammetry, as the name implies, is based on using photos. So before we jump into the software, we'll just need to cover a few of the important fundamentals for taking good source photos. Basically, you wanna take photos of a subject that is brightly lit with a strong diffuse light source. You want to shoot with a low ISO to reduce noise, a high shutter speed to reduce motion blur, and a closed aperture setting for a wide depth of field. Our goal is to get clear, crisp pictures, with ideally no blur. Maintaining consistency in your photos will really help the software. You want to stick with a fixed focal length, so try not to zoom in and out with your lens. You can move forward and backward physically if you want to get the subject in frame, but don't change the zoom by twisting the lens to do so. Some people even tape down their lens to prevent accidentally changing the zoom. 3D Flow Zephyr is the photogrammetry software we use at TVA Surge. Even though it's only available on PCs and we've mostly used Macs, we experimented with several options and we simply found that we got the best results with 3D Flow Zephyr. So without further ado, let's jump into the software. All right, so here we are inside of 3D Flow Zephyr. This is what the software is gonna look like when I open it up. And I can start a new project by going to Workflow and New Project. And so this is gonna open up a dialog box that eventually this is where we're gonna be importing our photos. But there's just a few options we, we might wanna set at the very beginning. Depending on what kind of photos and quality you have, you might also want to mask the images. So we'll get back to this a little bit later. I will say that for most of our cases, we do use masking because we have to pull down some of those settings. So even though I recommended you use a low ISO, fast shutter speed, closed aperture, unfortunately in the OR, we just have horrible lighting conditions. So we end up having to use less than optimal settings on the camera. And that means that masking the photos for our purposes actually is something we're, we're going to be doing. Now we can also, if we have really good photos and we don't need to tweak any of these steps along the way, we can actually turn on these options here for computing the 3D model after the project is created. So if I check on this first option here, it's going to compute the dense point cloud and the 3D mesh. It's going to go through all three of those first steps. And then this option, compute the texture after the surface extraction. That means create the, the final step, create the texture map on the geometry model. So we can actually automate the entire process in this first window if we check on these two options here. But I'm actually not gonna do that because I want a little bit more control. So we're gonna go next and here we go, we're gonna import our photos. So I'm gonna click the, the plus icon here. I'm gonna to go to my folder where I know my photos are. Just hit Control A for all the photos, open those up, and then they're in here. You can actually also, uh, if you have a window open, you can just pull that in and drag in all your photos. So we'll go next. So here's where we can launch the masquerade feature which is going to allow me to mask the photos. And this can be really helpful when you have photos that do have depth of field, but there's otherwise good information in there. Also for the photos we take in the OR, we frequently do have to mask them because for photogrammetry, you don't want anything in your photos to have changed. You want everything to be consistent, but that's almost impossible for us in the OR because people are moving around, uh, things are being moved. So we, we simply can't control for that. So when we go through our photos, we're gonna find some where we see people in the background and we're just gonna wanna mask that out. So I do use the masking feature, uh, the polygon tool, is sort of like the main way that you would go in here. You can click and create a mask to surround the subject. 
and then we're going to click the plus button to add that and so the portion of the photo that is red is the mask and that is what is going to be kept so we're going to click save and so now I have this little M in parentheses next to the photo, and that means there's a mask applied to it. Now, when you're going through tons and tons of these photos, sometimes you might just want to grab a big chunk of it and apply a mask that way. And this is also acceptable. When I'm dealing with massive photo sets, it's going to be really time consuming to go through all these photos and be super precise with the mask. You actually might even benefit from including some of this detail in the background, the um, where the, the surface that the object is laying on. Those are still points that the software can pick out and compute 3D depth from. So I actually do leave in good chunks of the, the surface. Again, it's just as long as that that surface or that object is staying consistent throughout the entire batch of photos, then it's fine to, to leave in. And after I've gone through and found the photos that I think are troublesome and need masking, I've completed all my masks, I can exit the masquerade. And now when I return to this masking window, I just want to hit refresh. And that's going to load the masks on each of the images where I applied them. So now these are all the, the presets for going through that process of each of these steps. So for most of the types of subjects we're working with, we're going to either use close range or we're going to use human body. These two presets are the ones to go with. I usually do close range because we have uh, some colors that may be unnatural, but for a lot of specimens, color range tends to be more reddish. The human body preset will have a higher sensitivity to colors that show up on, uh, on skin. So that might actually work well for uh, surgical subjects. But I'm going to stick with close range. And then if we want just like a quick reconstruction just to see what we've got, to, just to see how good our photos are, we can use the lowest setting, which will be fast for each of these so now I'm going to run, and this is going to uh, give me my sparse point cloud. And so once the sparse point cloud has been created, we're going to get this pop-up window that says reconstruction successful. And we'll be able to scroll through here and see which of the photos were included. And it looks like in this batch, miraculously, it's included all of them, which is actually pretty rare. Um, but that's awesome. Okay. All right, and this is the sparse point cloud that was generated. So now that we've got something to work with in the scene, we can talk a little bit about the UI and the layout of the tools in 3D Flow Zephyr. And we'll continue to refine this as we go. So as I already pointed out in the top uh, left of the UI here, you're going to find these icons for going through each of the stages of the workflow in 3D Flow Zephyr. So we can open a previous project, we can save our current project, which you will want to do often as anything with 3D. Uh, you have to be mindful that crashes can and do happen. So the 3D model generation will take us from the sparse point cloud to the dense point cloud and to the mesh. So with our sparse point cloud selected, if we hit this icon, which right now is highlighted, uh, we can go through the next step which is the dense point cloud creation again we're going to use close range if i'm not getting the best results with this i will also try the human body preset and then again for just a quick demo we can do fast later on we might want to start trying the higher settings and then you'll notice that we immediately go into surface reconstruction so this is immediately going to go from the dense point cloud to the 3d mesh and again i'll do close range and for the demo we'll just we'll just do fast and then we'll hit next and this is going to give us the opportunity to run that okay so our reconstruction has completed I'm going to hit finish here and you can see we have our reconstructed model so right now it's skipped us over to the mesh but if i go back to the dense point cloud i can see almost indiscernible but if i start zooming in really close you can see that this is made up of all just 
vertex points, which have color applied to them. And this included more of the background than I really needed. So if I want to have this be a mesh where I don't have all this extra stuff on the outside, I'm going to use the dense point cloud to generate that. So what I'm going to use is my uh, editing features on the right hand side. I'm going to go to the by hand and I'm going to use the selection tool. And right now I'm in the rectangle selection, so I can click and drag and that's going to select points that are be going to become red and that'll make them active. If I want to navigate around in the scene and if I click and drag, it's going to it's going to be in the selection mode still. So what I actually want to do is pause this mode and now when I click and drag in the scene, I can use the navigation features again. What I'm going to do is select the portion of the mesh that I want to keep and I'm going to invert that. So it's going to select all the points outside of that and then I'm going to delete them. And some of these overhangs, this is going to cause some problems when I try to do my retopology later. And so I'm going to take the trouble here of going in and deleting out the bottom portions of this point cloud. All right, so I'm satisfied with the point trimming that I've done off the dense point cloud. And now I want to turn this into a mesh. If I go up to the workflow icons and I hit the 3D model generation, this is going to take me through the two steps of starting with the point cloud, going to the dense point cloud, and then the mesh. So if I go in here, just use the presets for right now, it's telling me it's gonna do dense point cloud, and then the mesh, the surface reconstruction. So I actually don't want to do this. Instead, I'm going to have the dense point cloud selected. I'm going to go into advanced and I'm going to do mesh extraction. So that will skip the dense point cloud generation and it will only do the mesh extraction step, which is what I want to do here. So I've got the dense point cloud selected. I'm going to hit next and then it takes me right to that surface reconstruction options. So for here, we'll just do close range and fast. And we'll run that. All right, so about 13 minutes later, we come back and we've got this. So the main difference is that this has retained all of those changes that we did to the dense point cloud. So when I did the automatic process, I ended up with this. A lot of mess to be cleaned up here. But when I trimmed the dense point cloud, I get this mesh, which is going to be much better to work with. And when I go to the next step, this is really the most important reason why I do this. I'm going to now go into the textured mesh. So I'm going to ask the software to take all the color information and put this onto a UV map. If I started off with this mess, then all this extra stuff on the outside that is completely unimportant will be taking up space on my UV map. So I want to utilize as much of the space on the UVs as possible for my specimen. So that's why I go through the trouble of, of trimming it down to size. So now let's do the final stage. We're going to make a textured mesh out of this. Uh, even though we see the color information on this, if uh, I export it at this point, it's actually only going to look like this. So this is what the OBJ file will, will look like. In order to get the color information, what I need to do is export a textured mesh. So I'm going to have to generate the textured mesh first. Click that. It's going to ask me which mesh I want to use. And I do want to use the second one. Sometimes it defaults to the first one that was created. So you just want to like check that. Um, and then we're going to go to the next again here. We can do, um, the, the default single texture. If we want to do multiple texture maps, um, we can set that here. High details is going to really churn out as much quality and in, into the texture map as it possibly can. Um, but for our purposes, we can just do a default single texture. Now, if I go into the advanced features here, what's cool is I can 
change the size of the texture map so I can pick a 4K or 8K. Uh, I'm going to leave it at 8K. I also have some control over the max number of vertices. And for this, I usually just do maximum. So the mesh that's going to get uh, spat out with with the texture map applied to it is going to be the maximum amount of geometry that I can get the software to give me. Um, this 32 bit textures, you're most likely not going to need this. So don't bother. Um, there are some additional features in here. So if you want to look through those, uh, go for it. But generally I go for like an 8k map. It actually probably won't make a full 8k map. It'll downsize it to maybe roughly around 4k or a little bit over 4k, but I go up to, I, I use the 8k settings so that it gives me, uh, the largest possible map. So I'm going to go next and then I'm going to hit run. All right. And our textured mesh is complete. That took uh, about eight minutes or so. Uh, so I'm going to just have a look at my textured mesh. And again, I'm going to use the tools. So turning off the light to have a look at the surface. And this is considered probably a bit too noisy for what it should uh, look like in an optimal reconstruction. Uh, so this is definitely an indication of not the best source photos. Yeah, you can definitely see that this is a pretty noisy surface, but the overall form and shape is there. Uh, and this does give us something that we can uh, work up. Keep in mind that a lot of the 3D modeling we've been doing over the years has been based on CT scan reconstructions. So the CT or MRI scan reconstructions are way worse than this. There's far less detail. And those have been the basis for our reconstructed models. So for us to have a look at this and see that, you know, some of these details of where the um, the tumors are, uh, some of the, the tissue on the liver surface. This is, this is more than we've had to do, work with in the past. It's, this is not a shining example of the best of what photogrammetry can do, but for our purposes, knowing that we're going to retopologize this, uh, this is, this is decent for us. So with the textured mesh selected, if I right click on it on the left-hand side of the UI here, I can view the UV map. And this gives me a sense of how that color information is being distributed across this, uh, this model. And it leaves some to be desired. Um, you know, this is, this is where that, uh, post-processing part of the workflow is going to come into play. I'm going to want to take this into ZBrush and use the, uh, the tools in there to optimize the UV space, but at least I know what I'm, uh, what I'm up against. I can also go into the tools and go to mesh filters, use the decimation filter. If I want to bring the polycon down, uh, the densification, if I wanted to increase the polygon density and retopology is pretty cool. This is similar to Z remesher, except unlike, uh, Z remesher, I'm only dealing with tries. So the triangular meshes are going to be, uh, cleaned up and reorganized, and they're going to try to have that be a bit more smooth and evenly distributed. So now with my complete textured mesh, I'm going to want to export this. So I'm going to go up to the top, hit export textured mesh. And this is going to give me the options for different file types. I'll probably use either an OBJ or an FBX, depending on the, the end point, the end destination. I'll pick a PNG for texture map. Definitely want to keep the normals on there. Re I do not want to rescale the texture. I do want to export as a single texture. And now I'm going to hit export, pick my location, name it. and export. And so that's it for me. Thank you so much for checking out my talk. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on Gmail. Uh, you can also reach out to me through the AMI hub. I'm uh, pretty active on there as well. And if you are not, you should be because the hub is the spot to be, man. There's so much great information being tossed around there. Also want to give a shout out to ZBrush because uh, the folks at Pixel Logic have been sponsors of the AMI for a while now. And ZBrush is a major part of what makes this whole work flow possible. Uh, but of course, also a shout out to the folks at 3D Flow Zephyr for having this amazing software that works so well, especially for our applications as medical illustrators. So please do check it out. And so yeah, that's it for me.